that's not what we really talk about when it comes to sports, right? Sports are often used as a distraction from large sociopolitical, sociopolitical issues unless it becomes the focal point of how the distraction is contributing to that problem, right? Remember, the Black Lives Matter movement didn't come to become a mainstream topic until football player Colin Kaepernick made it one. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. Uh, before we get into this episode, I want to tell you guys about some really awesome virtual shows coming up and really awesome live in-person shows coming up as well. Uh, if you enjoy these podcast episodes, if you enjoy the Fork Full of Noodles, I write, produce, and record them on the last Thursday of each and every month. The last Thursday of each and every month, it's a whole new show, and you can be in the virtual audience via Zoom every single month. Tickets are available for these shows right now. I'm also producing virtual stand-up comedy shows where I work on new material, tell stories from the road, tell stories from my life that'll eventually become material that you'll see me perform live on in-person shows. So if you want to come kind of see the process and enjoy uh, a more casual, laid-back stand-up comedy show uh, via Zoom o o over o on a vir in a virtual setting, you can be anywhere in the world for these, these virtual shows. Uh, come check those shows out. Uh, those ticket links are available on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, I'm also going to be on the road with Ron Placone for a week and a half, two weeks, uh, somewhere around there in April, from April 16th through the 25th. On the road with Ron Placone, we're coming to Pittsburgh, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, Burlington, Portland, Maine, Boston, Massachusetts, and New York City. So if you're in those cities or in cities surrounding those areas, please do come hang out with us. Grab your tickets. Again, you can go directly to my website, which is krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. Dot com. I hope to see some of you guys there. Uh, and while you're on my website, you can check out my stand-up comedy albums, most of which are available to download for free. Uh, you can also make donations, one-time donations, or become sustaining members. If you make monthly contributions, uh, you get a ton of bonus stuff, which includes uh, free tickets to both in-person shows and virtual shows as well plus bonus stand-up comedy and storytelling content and a bunch of other really cool surprises. Uh, so check that out, uh, and you can also sign up for my email list. And that's important because I'm pulling back from how much I'm posting on social media. Uh, I, I started just kind of automatically doing that, and that has been a great help to my mental health and has helped me focus more on my writing, has helped me focus more on uh, rebuilding my personal relationships and improving not just my mental health, but also my physical health as well, because I can concentrate a little bit more on that. So the email list is a really, really great way to keep up to date on what I'm doing. Email me back about you know what what you think about a particular piece or so on and so forth. So I hope you do that again. Go to my website krishmohanhaha.com. It's k r i s h m o h a n h a h a dot com. Thank you guys so much. And now on to the episode. Now the Pandora Papers and the Pandora Papers and the Panama Papers ex expose the use of tax havens to illegally hide money and evade taxes by the ultra wealthy. But there are a few names missing from that list: Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and other American billionaires were missing from the papers. And look, that's not because these guys are upstanding citizens that have given back to the society that built them. 
No, it, it's because they've benefit, benefited from the corrupt and very legal tax evasion system in America. In America, the average working class person who makes $70,000 a year pays a tax rate of 14%. And if you make over $600,000 a year, your tax rate is 37%. So if you're a billionaire, you'd pay 37% of your income to taxes, which would be hundreds of millions of dollars per billionaire pumped back into social programs, infrastructure. And yes, yeah, some of it will definitely have to go into whatever is keeping Nancy Pelosi together. It's a lot. Of, I feel like it's a lot of clothespins. Is, well, it's a huge clothespins budget for that. The top 25 wealthiest Americans increased their wealth by $401 billion between 2014 and 2018. They paid $13.6 billion in federal taxes over five years. That's a tax rate of 3.4%. And this is the collective tax rate of 25 billionaires. 25 billionaires together pay 10% less in taxes than someone who makes a fraction of a percent of their income. So the question you have to ask yourself with that is, do you believe that this is fair? And I'll go ahead and answer that question for you, assuming that you're a good person that believes in freedom and, you know, all that jazz. Uh, fucking no. No, this is not fair. Why would anybody think this is fair mathematically? It doesn't even make any sense. How could you know regular math and think that this makes any fucking sense? That's crazy. Why would you come up with any other answer if you believe in math? OK, so how do people like Bezos, Gates and Musk and Everybody in that in that one percent category, how do they get away with paying an astronomically low tax rate while average Americans are footing their bill? On an individual level, billionaires pay a maximum of three percent in taxes. Right. In 2007, Jeff Bezos paid zero dollars in taxes because he operated at a loss. His despite his income being reported as forty six million dollars, he should have paid approximately 17 million dollars in taxes that year. The losses come from side projects, deductions from interest payments, and vague categories like, quote, other expenses. Come on. I mean, come on. We all know what other expenses really means, Jeffy. Huh? It's pee porn, isn't it? That's what it is. It's definitely pee porn. We've all seen your, we all know how you treat your employees. We get it. You're into some weird shit. And no one's here to kink shame you, but we are going to shame you for being a piece of shit. So, look, this is what we fund when we shop at Amazon. Everybody that shops at Amazon should feel very dirty, very, very dirty about themselves. One of the ways that billionaires keep their taxes really low is by separating their income from their wealth. Wealth comes from assets like stocks trust bonds or property right this is why billionaires need like a, a summer home and uh, and a winter home and like a home for when the leaves change color and like a beach house and a condo and a fuck pad because you know you don't want to make god angry with all of your other assets but you still want to get your hands on somebody else's assets you know what i'm saying you guys get it you guys got it you guys got it. OK, so look, this is how wealth and income works, right? Out of $100 of income, the average American loses about $14 to taxes. The rest of them go to expenses. And if there's anything left, it goes into a savings. For average Americans, their assets in their wealth increases evenly with their taxes. For Jeff Bezos, his tax rate cumulatively over 12 years is 21% of his income. But most of Bezos' wealth is in stocks, and Amazon stock grew, and so his felt wealth is far, far, far greater than his actual taxes. Right? As you can see here, this is, this is the, 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 the difference between his income and his wealth. Right. Because Bezos belt is tied up in that. Right. He doesn't have to pay that much taxes. Americans actually paid one hundred and sixty dollars in taxes for every one hundred dollars of wealth growth. And Bezos pays a dollar nine per hundred dollars of wealth growth. 
And this is why it's not really a noble gesture when a billionaire says that their take home income is $1 for the whole year. I mean, realistically, this means that they get to cash in on things like EBT, social security, tax rebates, and welfare payments and continue to avoid more taxes. The national income tax was instated in order to pay for the civil war. Thanks, racists. I mean, look, at this point, no working class person should support any war effort, right? If, I mean, it really, if we were to just learn to talk this out and like share our feelings, maybe income taxes and taxes in general would be way lower and utilized for things like that actually mattered, like healthcare instead of killing black and brown people across the globe. By 1918, 15% of the American families paid taxes. About 80% of it came from the top 1%. The question of what counts as income came into question in 1916 when Myrtle Macomber received her dividends from Standard Oil, which she received in the form of additional shares. She paid her taxes and then challenged it in courts, claiming that she, had received, she hadn't really received any income but had gotten wealthier. Therefore, the shares were not taxable as direct income. So the Supreme Court ruled that the stocks and bonds and et cetera, et cetera, are not income and therefore cannot be taxed until there is some kind of currency involved. Macklemore's decision was criticized by the father of income tax, Cornell Hull, and he warned about how this could be taken advantage of. He said, quote, people can live upon the value of their company stock without selling it and, of course, paying for it. And this came true in the 70s when antitrust organizations stopped the breaking up of large monopolies. I mean, hell, we still see it today, right? Look at how many pies Jeff Bezos has his little claws into. Amazon sells everything from USB drives to socks to produce. Plus, he owns Whole Foods to control the grocery market. He owns Ring to control the surveillance market and the Washington Post to control the narrative market. He also has his own delivery service and he gets CIA and FBI contracts regularly. I mean, remember, he started out as an online book vendor and now has infiltrated every single market with ease. At this point, the only thing people don't the only thing that people don't buy from Amazon is is books. So if a large sum of their wealth is tied up in assets, how do these guys remain rich if they can't spend their assets? Simple. They take out loans. Large banks and financial institutions will approve loans for extraordinary sums of money with low interest rates, which remain untaxed. And it shows that these billionaires are operating at a loss. They use these loans to purchase other businesses, properties, and turn them into more untaxed assets or massive refunds. The most absurd example of this is Ethel Mars of the Mars chocolate fame. Yes, that's right, guys. Billionaires have ruined chocolate. Are you still on their side? Hmm? They have corrupted America's national fruit, which I remind you is chocolate. Ethel Mars got the entirety of her horse farm written off her taxes by saying the Milky Way horse farm was advertising for her husband's company. She saved $288,000 on her taxes in the 1910s. In today's money, that's like a metric fuck ton of dollars. Let me double check that real quick. Yep, it's a metric fuck ton of dollars. But that's not all. You guys like sports balls? Huh? Who doesn't? Ah, it's so many balls in varying sizes and, and shapes. Ah, it's like a geometric wet dream, isn't it? Huh? That's why people watch sports. I know billionaires do love sports balls because owning a sports team is a great way to legally pay less in taxes. Owning a sports team means operating on a loss pretty much all the time. The cost of operating a team is fully deducted from a billionaire's taxes for the duration of owning the team. 
since the 40s, player salaries are deducted from the owner's taxes. And this is done by purchasing each player's individual contract before the sale of the company is complete. So even if a team makes a profit, the owner takes a loss based on the total sale price of the whole team. The teams also get subsidies from local governments to build and operate large stadiums and arenas. And this comes from cutting things like health care, teacher salaries, food stamps, and you know other things victims of wage theft need to survive. But that's not what we really talk about when it comes to sports, right? Sports are often used as a distraction from large sociopolitical, sociopolitical issues unless it becomes the focal point of how the distraction is contributing to that problem, right? Remember, the Black Lives Matter movement didn't come to become a mainstream topic until football player Colin Kaepernick made it one. Now, in 1993, to prevent new sports dynasties from being owned, Congress did try to limit the benefits of these intangible assets to 15 years. They expanded this to TV and radio deals, but this new expansion left out the sports teams. But fear not, you guys, because I know you guys were like, oh, man, this is crazy. What about those sports teams that give these billionaires super huge tax breaks? They're going to be those billionaires might be become like slightly less billionaires. That's so crazy. Don't worry. Baby boy Bush took care of it when he became chancellor and overlord of the American military. In 2004, he undid the 15 year limit and included sports teams in the expanded intangible benefits definition. Now, did Bush do this because he's a huge believer in the merits of athletics for both physical and mental health? Or, or, or perhaps he's just a really big fan of camaraderie and sportsmanship. Uh, no, uh, that's crazy. Uh, for that to be true, you would need like a functioning brain and a heart and, you know, like a soul, all of which Bush sold to Halliburton when Cheney became vice overlord. No, he did it. Because the MLB lobby pressured him to, and he owned the Texas Rangers at that time. With this, owning a sports team meant that you can add the cost of TV ads, radio and TV contracts, along with player salaries, and basically reduce your taxes by 90%. But the IRS is fine with this because they say that depreciating assets are necessary to write off for a growing business. But if that was the case, then a self-employed individual like myself can make the case that anything that keeps me alive is a vehicle for making revenue for my solo enterprise. Every meal I eat, 100% of the rent I pay, gas I spend in my car, the money I spend on utilities would all be deducted from my taxes. But unfortunately, that is not the case when it comes to the average working class person. And all this really proves is that there are two different economies and two sets of laws in our society. And there's a big hypocrisy under one of the most fundamental rules of capitalism here. If the idea of a business within capitalism is to gain more and more wealth each quarter, and we agree that sports teams are operating on at a loss pretty consistently, then what is the logical reason for owning a sports team? There isn't one. Uh, unless you can get an even bigger tax break by owning one at a loss. But when you bring this up to a billionaire, they're not big fans of it. You know, they respond the same way that 1940s Cleveland Browns owner Bill Veek responded. He said, quote, look, we play the Star Spangled Banner before each game. You want us to pay income taxes too? What? Yeah, fucking yeah. Yeah, we do. I, well, what does playing a racist and violent song have to do with a game that exploits black athletes? OK, no, wait, I hear it. I heard it. I heard it as I was saying it. Yep. I mean, none of these would be truly American sports without racism being at its core. Right. Still, a quote, patriotic song doesn't actually help your country or its citizens. Hence, these owners are making your favorite games, sports games, highly unpatriotic. But wait, there's more. Now, when an owner of a sports team dies, they don't have to pay taxes on the depreciated amount of the team. They can just give the whole thing to their heirs, and the cycle begins anew. This is called the circle of fucking your life. Yeah, 
Sports teams are a great way to escape the estate tax, which has been a thorn in the side of the ultra-rich for a very long time. The estate tax get paid when a rich person dies and the sum of their wealth goes, uh, wealth and income gets taxed at about 40%. And the only way to evade these taxes is to give your son or daughter an inheritance while the billionaire is still alive. Or when that doesn't work, then they leave it for their grandkids. So procreation is incredibly important, not because of love or wanting to carry on your family name or any of that bullshit. No, but for business reasons, real American reasons, right? We need to figure out who's going to carry on this hoarded wealth. Look, every capitalist, Democrat or Republican, liberal or conservative, harps on the poor having a lot of kids as a way to get more in welfare payments and save money on taxes, right? Yet we have not heard a peep from these same people when the rich are literally doing the exact same thing. They wrote it into law that they evade taxes by giving it to their heirs. The rich are the only ones having anchor babies in America. Okay, and the anchor babies are drowning the working class. Now, imagine telling a kid that they were born to help grandma and grandpa avoid taxes and keep the average working class struggling nonstop. You know, the options for that kid to continue, you know, is to either continue being a sociopath like his ancestors, because they're all, all they are is just a walking pile of cash or revolt against the system that their grandparents set up to ensure the lives of billions of other people are bettered. Or, yes, they could become like a really warped version of Batman who's like super dead on the inside and is very okay with beating up poor people. That's an option, too. That's an option, too. I feel like I just pitched the next Zack Snyder Batman reboot. Fuck. Ugh. Look, regardless, capitalism is breeding a new generation of trauma and mental illness. Andrew Mellon is the architect of how people can hide their assets and escape paying taxes even at their demise. Mellon was President Harding's Treasury Secretary and, again, is called the prophet of trickle-down, so you know he was drowning in fiscally responsible and wildly racist pussy. You know how we do. You know how we do. Look, as the head of the Bureau of Internal Revenue, he ordered them to find 10 loopholes that the rich can use. He later confesses to using five of them. I, 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 su I suppose we should adorn him for not using all 10? Way to go, Andy. Way, way to show some restraint, buddy. Okay, maybe this fact will convince you that we shouldn't be building statues of Cretans like him or worshipping these people like noble gods. The Mellon family believed the rich had to pay high taxes because of black people and voting rights. Yeah, it wouldn't really be a true American story if it wasn't blatantly racist, just for kicks. When President Franklin Delano Roosevelt wanted to raise the taxes on the super wealthy to 94%, which would have included a raise to the estate tax, Mellon responded by saying, quote, the social necessity for breaking up large fortunes in this country does not exist. He followed that up by saying, I am this country. Yeah, and then he became capitalism itself, you guys. Okay, some say, some say, you can hear him disparaging the poor every time someone takes out cash at the ATM. Just little whispers, just little whispers. He also called the estate tax economic suicide, which only goes to show that the that mental health concerns are real when it comes to, it comes to the economy, right? When the economy faces trauma, everybody's like, oh my God, we should really care about people's mental health, right? When the Wall Street algorithm no longer sees the value of its own life and wants to kill itself. The billionaires are empathetic to talk about things like suicide awareness and depression. Oh, the silent killers. But as he was becoming more of a walking ego flesh bag, the Great Depression occurred in part thanks to the tax cuts that Mellon awarded his rich pals. Now, Mellon's estate wound up paying about $668 million in taxes, but that was a drop in the bucket considering most of his assets had been parsed out to his kids. 
And Mellon's not the only one that's gone after the estate tax. The first black billionaire, Robert Johnson, owner of Black Entertainment Television Network, claimed that eradicating the estate tax would shrink the income divide between black and white Americans. Now, when asked to explain, explain this in intimate detail, he threw down a smoke bomb and in his place was Cedric the Entertainer. Every, everybody was confused, including Cedric. He didn't know how he got there. It was, very, it was a terrifying moment for all of us involved. I don't understand how that happened. But look, this is incredibly false, considering only 59 out of the 38 million black people that live in America have to pay estate taxes. So I guess it would shrink the gap between a few white billionaires and the even fewer black billionaires. In 2001, farmers were the scapegoats of eradicating the estate tax. Right? George Bush claimed that the estate taxes were slashed to save farmers from losing their farms. And look, this was a huge far problem because a grand total of zero farmers had lost their farms to the estate tax. Fucking zero. The cruel fact about all this is that this is all legal. If you talk to any billionaire about their taxes, they usually respond by saying, they're paying all the taxes they owe. And it's true. The problem isn't just billionaires. It's the fact that our system is bought and sold. If you're going to have a government run by capitalism, all you'll see is rampant inequalities masquerading as the greatest democracy on earth. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode of Forkful of Noodles. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please give it a big old thumbs up. Uh, a retweet or, and, and share this out with as many people as you can. Share it with a friend, share it with an enemy, share it with anybody that you think would find some kind of value from this episode. Uh, the, the focus of this channel is and always will continue to be a, a historical and psychological lens on various sociopolitical topics, and I will do my best to uh, break them down and and uh, add add some comedic flavor so we can <laughs> we can all enjoy. Uh, the the depressing information that that uh, uh, that we all kind of have to contend with and hopefully drive positive change in our lives. So if you enjoyed that, if you if that that is uh, a goal that you enjoy, please, please do hit the like button. Please do make sure that you're subscribed to my channels uh, and please do share this out with as many people as you can. Uh, and if you want to become a sustaining member, make a one time donation. Um, come to a virtual show, come to a in-person live show and want to know when I'm coming to a city near you, you can do so directly on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, I post videos on this channel uh, every Monday, every Thursday, and then infrequently throughout the weeks as well. Uh, so please do make sure you're subscribed. Please do make sure you're on the email list to get uh, new information from me and, and just a list of all the videos I've produced throughout the week. Uh, so uh, that, again, all of that is available directly on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. Uh, but till then, thank you guys for tuning in. Be good to yourselves. Be good to each other. And we'll see you on the road. Bye, guys.